Well, it is great to be back. Um, thank you very much indeed. I have to say that um, <clears throat> we've had the most three glorious weeks of weather in the United Kingdom. If anybody's been over to London, any, anybody make the wedding? Anybody went there? No, they didn't invite me either. But um, the weather has been spectacular, and I turned on my laptop this morning to catch up on the news, and of course, my Google immediately converted to Canada from the UK, and it, the headline was, Ski Resorts to Stay Open Longer. <laughs> and I thought, welcome back to Calgary. So, uh, but it is good to be here. It's a great part of the world, and of course, for an oil man, it doesn't get much better. Um, I have to say that I do speak quite a bit here and there around the world with all my various responsibilities. And there are times when I agree to do something, and then when the day comes, I think, why did I bother to do that? <laughs> Tom's laughing because he knows about this. And <laughs> this is completely the opposite. I, I can't tell you how important I think this discussion is. I think this is a brilliant initiative, Ed and Marlow, and, and I really wish it well. I will not be able to stay all day because I'm heading up to Edmonton in preparation for the launch on Thursday. And we'll be back here on Friday for press work and so on. So I hope you can engage with us on that. But I will be interested in what you're doing and I am keen to be part of any follow-up. This really matters. It's a key issue. It's a key issue for the industry. It's a key issue for the province. It's a key, issues, a key issue for all citizens of the province. And given the scale of resources in Alberta, of course, it's a key issue for the world. And this is a safe place to discuss it. And that, to me, is very precious. Not only a safe place, but a cross-section of ideas and experiences and representative institutions. Now, I have to say that I have been an oil man for yeah, nearly 40 years now. I still am. I still uh, work with oil, uh, both here and in Europe. Uh, I'm a businessman, and I hate being pigeonholed. I'm also an environmentalist. And I'm a grandfather, and a husband, and a father. And I'm all of those things. And I'm sure that you, in your various roles as well, probably at times think, why is it just because I work for Imperial that somebody slots me into oil company? I'm sorry, I'm picking on a delightful lady I met on the way coming in, um, a, a company I've all, always respected. And the fact is, of course, that in our complex human way, we hold many things in tension. They're not in conflict, but they are in tension. And that tension is because we live in a world where there are multiple influences playing on issues. I've always thought that if I had one dream in my next life, it would be as a single issue campaigner, because life would be so easy. <coughs> When you actually try and run things and make progress in society, be that in business or politics or activism or NGOs or whatever, you have to confront the variety of issues. And we do that as individuals as well as in all the roles we play. So this to me is an important place where we can bring those tensions together and hopefully develop something which will be of great importance. Now, what Marlow did not mention is that I've had a fascination with mathematics and numbers and measurement all of my life. Um, my wife, Anne, is utterly gobsmacked at my holiday reading. So she takes novels, historical romances, and I'm taking all the latest books on astrophysics and numbers. And she thinks, how can this turn you on? Well, it does turn me on. I've always loved maths, or math, as you would say, and so the, this particular field of endeavor, how we measure, plays to me personally. Now, of course, there are some jokes about measurement. I went on the web, as one does, and I discovered that the basic unit of laryngitis is one horsepower. <laughs> but the best measurement joke, but you have to think about this, is 
The shortest distance between two jokes is a straight line. <laughs> it's clever, isn't it? I like that. Anyway, enough of that. We had lots of interesting numbers uh, last night, very interesting numbers. Um, and we've had some very interesting numbers in the oil patch over the last year or so. Um, I was very interested in the $3 million which Syncrude volunteered to pay as part of the bargain that they struck with the regulators. I was very interested in the $55,800 which our Premier is reported to have paid for an advertisement in the Washington Post last July. And I'm daily impressed and I have to say deeply downhearted by the $2.28 per litre that I now pay for my gasoline in the United Kingdom. $2.28 a litre. So what's going on? Well, prices are high. Now, of course, the UK suffers from an excessive burden of taxation, and if we had a good Harper government, we might get to grips with that, but alas, we don't. Prices are high, and that is sending a signal to the markets come on, bring more production. And guess what? The markets are responding. In this case, the oil and gas sectors are responding. And for a jurisdiction like Alberta, which has the massive resources that it does, this is a great encouragement to bring on more production, which has led to pressure on projects, on people, on ponds, and so on. And in the wake of the BP problems, the word pollution has again started to appear a lot associated with the industry. And there has been negative publicity. And the ducks, well, those dear ducks, they have much to answer for. And what's been the response? Paranoia? Panic? Purpose? Well, I think a bit of all three. Uh, certainly there has been some paranoia. If you read some of the mudslinging in the press, I would say it uh, bordered on the intemperate. There's certainly been a lot of thrashing around trying to find the right way forward, but I think there has also been great purpose. I'm enormously impressed with Osley and the work that it's trying to do. And I think within government, there has been a real desire now to get to grips with some of the key fundamentals. Uh, not all of the changes to regulation would impress me. I think fiddling around with royalties is um, a little bit short-term and counterproductive. But I think, for, for example, the focus on the CCS fund and ongoing environmental issues are certainly worthy of great respect. The fact is that there are fundamentals in this industry which are really, really tough. Um, I was CEO here. <coughs> I was committed to safe and orderly development of the oil sands for which Shell had responsibility. And it didn't take many hours before I realized that the challenge here was an order of magnitude greater than anything I had ever seen in my career. I mean, deep water drilling, even in the Atlantic, is not as tough as it is here. This is grinding hourly <coughs> challenge on equipment, on facilities, on people. And whenever I talk about the potential of the oil sands and the admiration I have for the people in the industry, I always say, well, if you're not sure, just come up with me to Fort McMurray in February and I'll get you kitted out and we'll go out for an hour or two. We won't actually do any work, but we'll just go out there and have a look. And when you do that, you realize how demanding this is. <coughs> it's very expensive and the environment, environmental impact is big, very big. So we are exposed. The scale of the resources is a great comfort. 
the excellence of the industry in terms of developing technologies to bring this on stream is also a great comfort. But there is no comfort in a world where, with the oil price signals we have, every effort is now being made to develop competitor production. What do I mean by competitor production? Well, to bring on stream any hydrocarbons that can be found, conventional resources, oil and gas. Substitution in the form of renewables. I work with Iogen in Ottawa with cellulosic ethanol, but there are lots of renewable plays around. And when companies like Exxon put the dollars that they are currently investing into algae, take it seriously. And then there is substitution in the form of conversion. And I have been out in the Middle East now and seen some of the plants that are converting natural gas into distillate. It's a massively expensive process. And it too has big environmental impacts. But it's happening because it's underpinned by these economics. All of these are competitors to Alberta. And all of these tell us that the world does not owe us a living. And given our high cost, and given our environmental impact, we are vulnerable. And we must address both of those. Now, in the debate around what is the social and environmental impact, it's pretty hard, I think, to understand clearly what's going on. And that, of course, I think lies much behind why we're here today. Partly because there are so many parts to this particular equation, and partly because of the natural competitive pressures that exist within the industry. So it's all very well the public saying, well, why doesn't the industry get together? Well, understand that. Yes, we do get together in the sense that we th share through industry associations like CAP certain common agendas. But our role in society is to compete. That's what we're here to do. The law requires us to compete. Why? Because through competition, you get improvement. Through competition, you get innovation. So it's not surprising that people come with different agendas and will be promoting their own interests. But it's reached the point now where I'm not sure that's working to anybody's advantage. I gave a speech at the Alberta Chamber of Resources AGM in February, and ahead of and that's on the web if you want to read it. But ahead of that, I did some research on what oil companies are saying about their involvement with the oil sands. They're all very different, of course, because of that competitive instinct, but in some ways they're all similar. They all talk about compliance to regulation, they all talk about commitment to invest in new solutions to address the challenges that we understand. And they're all similar in terms of their responsibility for clear reporting of their performance plans and projects. And it therefore sounds, to me at least, very plausible. Not sure about you, but I think, well, if companies are prepared to give those commitments, that's great. But it's not winning the battle. It's not winning the battle of the hearts and minds of the wider stakeholder community. Um, Engos, politicians, most of the media, and a lot of Canadians, including here in Alberta, are not very impressed. And it's not just the odd film director that goes up to Fort McMurray and takes the pictures. The commentaries, even in very responsible <coughs> magazines and media, have been trenchant. trenchant. And, of course, the photographs are compelling. People are not convinced that the development has been or will be orderly and safe. Because when they look at the various claims and commitments from the industry, they see unclear commitments in terms of the detail. They see differences between one index and another. 
they find it hard to understand why, if everybody is claiming to be as good as they are, that they're not getting a better press. Now sometimes, I have to say, I think I live on a different planet. Now this is not just having what witnessed the pomp and circumstance of the royal wedding in London. But when I come to Alberta and I talk about these things, there are some people who frankly don't get it or don't want to get it. And I find that surprising because the risks of not addressing this lack of credibility are to my mind very real. So I don't stand here as somebody who believes that development of the oil sand should stop. On the contrary, I think this is a fabulous resource. I think the world will need those hydrocarbons and will probably find that in the long term they're more economic than many of the so-called green alternatives. But the fact is, the real fact is that we need to get to grips with the hearts and minds of our stakeholders. And part of that will be, I think, agreeing common standards commonly reported. And that's what today is about. Common standards commonly reported. At least I hope it is. Why are good metrics so important? Why are they so powerful? Well, of course, you start by saying you measure what you manage and you manage what you measure. And everybody who's been in business understands that very clearly. It is critical to decision making. It is critical to performance improvement. And it's critical to long term planning. And I have to say as well, as a CEO, nothing concentrates the mind like a league table. Whether you're at school, whether you're playing hockey, or whether you're Shell Canada, if somebody publishes a league table, you very quickly have a look at where you are. And if you don't like it, you do something about it. Now, lots of people will tell you, oh, ah, oh, these league tables, they don't tell the whole story. Yeah, they may say that. But boy, when they're back in their office, they're getting after. Why is it we're in the second half of this particular group? Measure, manage. Good metrics also provide a unifying focus within an organization. They direct attention and resources to the right things. More importantly still, they bring together stakeholders across the spectrum because they enable people to talk the same language. And that's what today's about. And lastly, through consistent and clear communication, they build integrity and trust. And both of those, I believe, are badly needed. Now, um, I'm going to cheat now. I know Marlowe said this is not about developing specific metrics. And he certainly doesn't want me to preempt the discussion by saying what I think. But I'm going to do it anyway. So here's the three things I hope that we will get to as a result of this process. The first thing is clarity. And by clarity, I mean not fudging. Whatever the metrics come out, they must be practical in the sense that they can be understood by ordinary people. You don't need to have a PhD to understand what we're talking about. So please, can we have clarity? And please, can everybody here who's not representative of the industry understand that those in the industry are required by law to compete. And therefore, it's not easy to get them to the point that they have, excuse me, not just that clarity, but that commonality. And the, that's the second point. We have to have consistency. This will not work unless the metrices are identical in every application whether it's government policy, whether it's environmental reporting, whether it's industry standards or whatever, they have to be the same. And the last thing is, they have to be purposeful. 
in the sense that they have to drive to address or improve a key issue. I think a lot of companies, and my own included, fall into the trap of thinking that quantity helps. So if you go on to reports, you'll find a whole list of metrics which, in essence, are academic. We're not into that. We don't need pages and pages and pages of these things. We need a relatively small number which purposefully address the key issues. So apologies, Marlo. That's what I think, and I hope that that's where we get to. Um, it's been a privilege uh, just to have a small involvement here today. Um, thank you for having me. I wish you well. Uh, this is so, so important. It is foundational, I think, for the future. And it plays into some of the things that the Premier's Council will be saying on Thursday. Can I just say, I do hope you will take the time to have a flip through this report. Not just because I've invested um, many hours in my contribution to it, but because I think it is a very special and unique opportunity to think ahead to the future. This is not about short-term politics. This is about thinking 30 years ahead on what would be those key fundamental things we could start to do now, which would make a real difference in almost any scenario. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it stimulating. And I think the work that you're doing here today will be an important part of making some of those things possible. Thank you.